God's will, His plan, His purpose, His desire is that everyone come to know Him and have a relationship with Him. God wants everyone to spend not just eternity in His presence, but to live each day on this earth in a relationship with Him. Hi there church and welcome to our Bible study in the book of John that we are looking at this week. Today's passage that we are looking at is taken from John chapter 6 verse 35 to 40, picking it up from where Pastor Eden left off for all of us last week. And if you are ready with your notes and pen and if you have the Bible with you, please turn to the book of John chapter 6 verse 35 to 40. We want to read it together. Okay, so let us read the passage together and this is what Jesus said. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those He has given me but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have eternal life. I will raise them up. Okay? I will raise them up at the last days. Wow. What a passage. What a passage. Amen? You know, verse 35 begins with Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. You know, I am the bread of life, John 6.35 is one of the seven I am statements of Jesus. You know, Jesus used the same phrase, I am, in seven declarations about himself. In all seven declarations about himself, he combines I am with the tremendous metaphors which express his saving relationship towards the world which is lost. And all of them appear in the book of John. You know, John 6.35 says, I am the bread of life life and whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst wow you know something bread is considered a staple food for example a basic dietary item in certain countries for us it's rice for other countries it would be bread a person can survive a long time on only bread and water bread is such a basic food item that it becomes synonymous for food in general we even use the phrase here breaking bread together you know to indicate the sharing of a meal with someone bread also plays an integral part of the jewish passover meal you know the jews were not to eat uh, were, were to eat unleavened bread during the passover feast and then for seven days following as a celebration of the exodus from egypt finally when the jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years for 40 years god rained down bread from heaven to sustain the nation exodus chapter 16 verse 4 and it is called manna you know what church all of this plays into the scene being described in john chapter 6 when jesus used the term the bread of life you know jesus he was trying to get away from the crowd to no avail he had crossed the sea of galilee and the crowd followed him after some time jesus inquires of philip how they are going to feed the crowd Philip's answer displays his little faith when he says they don't have enough money to give each one of them the smallest morsel of food for them to go buy and eat and feed their families. Finally, Andrew brings to Jesus a boy who had five small loaves of bread and two fish. With that amount, Jesus lifted out and miraculously fed the throng with lots of food to spare. He fed the crowds with lots of food to spare. Afterward, Jesus and his disciples crossed back to the other side of Galilee. When the crowd sees that Jesus has left, they followed him again. Jesus takes this moment to teach them a lesson. You know, he accuses the crowd of ignoring his miraculous sign and only following him for the free meal that he can offer them. You know, Jesus tells them in John chapter 6, verse 24, Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. In other words, they were so caught up and trolled with the food, they were missing out on the fact 
that their Messiah standing in front of them had come and is offering that bread. So the Jews asked Jesus for a sign that he was sent from God. As if the miracles feeding of the 5,000 and the walking across the water weren't enough for them. <laughs> they tell Jesus that God gave them manna during the desert wandering. <laughs> you know, Jesus responds by telling them that they need to ask for the true bread from heaven. That gives life. Wow. You know, when they ask Jesus for this bread, Jesus startles them by saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. Eh? Okay. You know what, church? This is a phenomenal statement. Why? First, by equating himself with bread, Jesus is saying he is essential for life. Second, the life Jesus is referring to is not a physical life, but eternal life. Jesus is trying to get the Jews to think of the physical realm and into the spiritual realm. He is contrasting what he brings as their Messiah with the bread he miraculously created the day before for them. That was physical bread. And when you eat it, it will perish. And he is offering spiritual bread that brings eternal life. Thirdly, and very important, Jesus is making another claim to his deity. This statement is the first of the I am statements that is found in the book of John's Gospel. You know, the phrase I am is the covenant name of God, Yahweh, revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. You know, this phrase I am speaks of self-sufficient existence or what theologians refer to as ascetity, okay, which is an attribute only God possesses. No one else, only God possesses. It also a phrase that Jews who were listening would have automatically understood as a claim that Jesus is trying to say that he is God. A claim to deity. Fourth, notice the word come and believe. This is an invitation for those listening to place their faith in Jesus as their Messiah and as the Son of God. This invitation to come is found throughout John's Gospel. Coming to Jesus involves making a choice to forsake the world and to follow Him. Believing in Jesus means placing our faith in Him, that He is that He is who He says He is, and that He will do what He says He will do, and what and that He is the only one who can do it and say it. Fifth, there are the words hunger and thirst. Again, it must be noted that Jesus isn't talking about elevating. Or, or, or disregarding physical hunger or thirst. The key is found in another statement Jesus made back in his sermon on the mount in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6. Jesus says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When Jesus says those who come to him will never hunger and those who believe him will never thirst, what is Jesus saying? He's saying he will satisfy our hunger and thirst to be made righteous in the sight of God. Wow. If there's anything that history of human religion tells us, it is that people seek to earn their way to heaven. They seek to earn their way to heaven. Now this is such a basic human desire because God created us with eternity in mind. The Bible says God has placed the desire for eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. You know, the Bible also tells us that there is nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven because we all have sinned. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. And the only thing our sin earns us is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. So there is no one who is righteous in himself. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. Our dilemma, church, is we have a desire we cannot fulfill no matter what we do or try to do. This is where Jesus comes in. He and He alone can fulfill that desire in our hearts for righteousness through the divine transaction. For it says, For our sake He made Him to be seen who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.21 When Christ died on that cross, church, He took the sin of mankind upon Himself and made atonement for them. When we place our faith in Christ, our sins are imputed to Jesus and His righteousness is imputed 
to us. Wow. You know, Jesus satisfies our hunger and thirst for righteousness. He is our bread of life and our living water. We shall never be hungry again. Amen? And uh, we shall never be thirsty again. That, that leads us to verse 36. You know, in verse 36 it says, But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Wow. To understand this word, I encourage you to look up Pastor Eden's Bible study on the bread of life last week to get the context of this verse. In a nutshell for all of us, just as in chapter 2 and chapter 5 of the book of John, the people did not believe who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do and what Jesus offers them. Wow. You no, know, Jesus was the Son of God who came to be our Savior. Jesus came to die on the cross to save us from our sins. God offers His bread, His Son, to His own people and His own people did not receive Him. You know what? God offers His Son and man is responsible okay, to see and believe and to receive it, to receive Jesus. But they do not want to see, do not want to believe and do not want to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Saviour. You know, Jesus saw this unbelief of our human nature and He saw it with a heart of sorrow. Because we can see Jesus weeping as he looks over the people because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd in the book of John, he says. And he says, I am the good shepherd in the book of John. And he calls his sheep to himself because he knows he is the one who will prepare a table for us. He is the one who can protect us and provide for us. He is the one who will lead us to the green pastures and to the gentle streams. He is the one who will satisfy. But you know what? They did not believe trust or put their faith in Him. Now church, I want you to know this. All is not lost. Because they were not believing in Jesus, all is not lost. Now you must understand this. God is sovereign over the works of a person's salvation. And He will not let His ultimate purpose for that particular person or for anyone to fail. And that's where verse 37 to 40 comes in. Where it teaches that God has a plan and his plan was Jesus. God is in control of our redemptive history. So let's look at verse 37 and let's break it down together. Verse 37 talks about the first of God's promises. And he says here, All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive them away. So in this particular verse, he tells us that God has a plan. Let's break it down. Right? Let's break down verse 37. Firstly, let's break it down to the first part. All those the Father gives me. What does it mean here? Who are, who are all these those whom the Father will give Jesus? Well, the answer is all of us who are sinners. He will give us to Jesus. Why? For we are created in His image and we all have seen and fall short the glory of God. The book of Genesis. You know, I like the way the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3 says. And it says like this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and of your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the, of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Verse 3, and all of us used to live our life that way, following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful nature. By our, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Church, because all of us are sinners, we need a saviour. We are dead and God must make us a life. And that's why the next part of that verse says, will come. What does will come mean? God is a God and has a plan. That plan is redemption through Jesus Christ. God does not wait for us to come to Jesus because if He did wait for us to come to Jesus, we would never would. Because what? All of us are sinners living our own life, doing our own thing and not looking or bothered about God. So that is why it says here that God devised a plan and He gives us Jesus as the bread of life. Welcome. God is the one who secures our coming to Jesus. God works on our coming to Jesus when we don't want to come to Jesus. God works on our coming to Jesus. God guarantees our coming to Jesus. And when you come to Christ, and when I come to Christ, it is not because we decided, because God brought us. See, when you believe, it was God opening our eyes. When Jesus was understandable to us in our mind or made sense to us, right? we didn't make Jesus 
look all satisfying to our hearts. God did that by the power of the Holy Spirit who convicts us. And when God did, you came freely with all our resistance overcome coming to Jesus. What does then, the next portion of the thing, what does then whoever will come mean? It means that the movement of the soul which takes place from when a man feeling his sin and finding out that he cannot save himself, hears of Christ, applies, uh, uh, applies to Christ, appeals to Christ, trusts in Christ, lays hold of Christ and lean all his weight on Christ for his salvation. When this happened, a man is said in scripture, language to come to Christ. When we come to Jesus, we know at least three things. One, we shall not hunger. Two, we shall never be thirsty. And three, we will never be cast out. Because that's what it says in the next verse. Okay? I will never cast him out or drive him away. The end of that sentence, all right, in the, uh, in the verse of 37 says, it means Jesus Christ will not refuse to save anyone who those who come to him, no matter their past sin or current weakness. It is a joy to know that we have a Savior who welcomes us to himself, will not drive us away. You know what, church? If you look at the gospel, he welcomed the prostitute to sit at his feet and wash his feet with her tears and with her hair. You know what, church? He welcomes the tax collectors, the Pharisees who came to him at night. He welcomes them, the Jews and the Gentiles. He will not cast them out. He will not drive them away. He welcomes me and you. And what a joy it is to come into the presence of the one who has invited you, who welcomes you, who promised to never cast you out. But he will receive you graciously, pardon you freely, justify you completely, and glorify you ultimately. It pleases him to bring you into his family and give you everlasting life. Wow, that's verse 37. And now in verse 38, it says this. In verse 38, it says this. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What does that mean? Three things we got to know from this particular verse, verse 38. In this verse, Jesus also makes an additional reference to his obedience to God the Father. You know, as part of the Trinity, Jesus Christ is God the Son. So, his will and the will of the Father are always in alignment, in agreement. And yet, as a fully human man, Christ also experienced the temptations and emotions of a physical person. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that. And part of his sinless example to us is his willingness to obey God, no matter the consequences. Mark chapter 14. And willing to obey God, no, and no matter the personal cost to himself. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Jesus also, second thing, also pointing out that the ministry he has been given comes from God and ought to be recognized as such. And the third thing, and the third thing this verse says to us is this. What was the will of God that Jesus came to do? Because he said, I came to do not my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. What was the will of God that Jesus came to do? Well, let me sum it up for you. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have a everlasting life. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Jesus Christ. So what was God's will for him that he came to do? What was his mission? Jesus came to seek and save the lost and praise God that you and I was one of them that got saved. Hallelujah. All right? And he set his affection upon us and called us. It doesn't matter how lost you, you are because loss is loss. And when you are lost, he set his affection upon you and he called you by name. Wow, that's verse 38. And that leads us to verse 39 that talks about another promise of God. Amen? Another promise of God. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me, but raise it up on the last day. You know what it means? Those who come to Christ shall not be lost. Jesus is the one who goes after the lost sheep. Jesus is the one who would clean the house to pursue the lost coin. Jesus is the one who runs after the lost sheep. Jesus is the seeker of your soul, for there is none who seek him. Not, no, not even one. But he came to seek and save that which is lost. So if you are here listening to the Bible study today, and you do not know Jesus, Jesus is seeking you. If you walked away from Jesus, Jesus is seeking you. He's calling you to come and dine in his presence and to be satisfied in the depth of your soul with the nourishment that only he provides. Only he can satisfy. Only he can fulfill. 
you know, from grace to glory. Christ will hold you fast and will keep you safe in spite of the world, the flesh and the devil coming against you. You know what? Be exhorted. Praise be the God for so often those three enemies are rising up in our lives and they are seeking to draw us away from God. But the Lord has promised that those who are His cannot be snatched out, snatched out from His good hands. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. No one or nothing can stop that from happening. You know, Christ is the receiver for all who come and the perseverer of all who believe in Him. And John 6 verse 40 says another verse that talks about the promises of God. For this is the will of my Father, that anyone who looks at, on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last days. You know, Jesus said in the book of Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. And Peter wrote in the book of 2 Peter, uh, you know, uh, chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken, he says here that, that the Lord is not slow to keep, in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Church, God's will, His plan, His purpose, His desire is that everyone come to know Him and have a relationship with Him. God wants everyone to spend not just eternity in His presence, but to live each day on this earth in a relationship with Him. And that is why Jesus came to this earth. Jesus simply and plainly states that anyone who looks to Him and believes in Him shall have eternal life. Is it really that simple? Can it be that simple? Church, of course. Why? Our salvation is free, gift from God. It is not something we can earn. Our sin demands justice. Our sin demands punishment. The price we have to pay is eternity in hell. But Jesus paid the price for all of us. The godly died for the ungodly. And we simply must accept His gift, His free offer of salvation. Church, we cannot earn salvation. We cannot do enough good to merit salvation. We simply just have to accept it, receive it, believe it. However, once we accept that wonderful gift, our life should and must change. When we realize the goodness, the graciousness of our God, our focus becomes on how to honor Him with our lives. And we will want to live that life, one that shows our gratitude to God, that appreciate His gift, that, that they're really thankful for the price He paid, that points others to Him as well to let them know about this great gift that we have received. Shall we pray? Father, we thank You for the privilege Lord, that we have to come to you for we are in many ways weary and heavy laden. You invite us to come and cast our cares upon you because you care for us. You invite us to come and eat that which satisfies and Lord, we praise you that you satisfy for once we come to you, we no longer have to go looking for satisfaction in other places. Lord, we also have the privilege to daily come to you and I pray, Lord, that we would do that. Spend time with you daily. Spend time reading the word, Lord, and getting the bread of life into our lives and obeying the bread of life, applying it, Lord, for our strength, for our nourish, nourishment, Lord Jesus, Lord. Lord, fill us, Lord, with the living water so that we will not thirst again. I pray, Lord, that as we partake of your bread, Lord, that we would rejoice in you and realize that it is in you alone, Lord, we receive all that we need. And that in you alone, you alone, Lord, is the one who receives us to you. Satisfy us and carry us to your Father's presence. So we may delight in you. We may delight in your living water that you offer us. That we delight in the bread of life that you offer us. Help us, Father, to live for you, to shine for you. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. The mighty, awesome, glorious, powerful name of all. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, church. God bless you. See you next week.